Thank you very much. Oh, sorry, this is loud, okay. <laughs> Thank you every, everyone for inviting me to give this talk. I'm going to be talking about the future of voice computing in the year. Um, as mentioned, I am the CEO and co-founder of a company called Smart Ear. Um, but before I go further, I have a confession to make, and that is I am not a developer. I've been in the hearing space for the last 20 years, um, as both as a researcher at MIT, Harvard, and Stanford, and as a research scientist at Advanced Bionics in Ireland. But through my journey space, what I came to conclude is that the ear is the optimal location for the next computing platform. And hopefully by the end of this talk, I could convince you guys of the same thing. So currently, people interact with applications primarily using a visual interface. For example, with Cisco Spark, some people might use it on a smartphone. Others use it on a tablet or a laptop or even the Cisco board. However, more and more people are realizing the power of voice. For example, we know how popular Amazon Echo is um, and how Apple and Google are following suit. The great thing about these devices is you can communicate hands-free. But the disadvantage is that it's not mobile. You can imagine you can't carry Amazon Echo to your workplace. And I think that's why um, voice assistants on the smartphone have become so popular. It's been predicted that by 2020, more than half of the searches will be via voice. But the problem with smartphone voice assistants is that you still need to use your hand. In other words, you have to take the smartphone out of your pocket to use voice. And that's why I think there's still a debate on what is the final form factor that a voice assistant will take. Um, but regardless of what that final form factor is, I truly believe that to have a true voice computing requires a complete platform so that the developers can really control the whole user experience. So what I mean by that is a device has to be really tightly integrated to a software platform that we call ELS, and I'll explain that a little bit later, so th which converts text into voice. And then we also need an AI engine so that we can talk to the device in a much more natural way, just like we talk to people. So throughout the talk, I'm going to talk about each of these three components in more detail. Again, I know most of you are developers, so I'm going to skim through the device really quickly. So as I mentioned earlier, currently voice via the smartphone is a very hands it's not hands-free. You still have to touch these buttons. The great thing about possibly having an ear device in your ear, if it's comfor to comfortable to wear all day, and if there's microphones and speakers in it, then you can imagine you have a voice assistant or a messaging platform in your ear. Also, another problem of using voice assistant on the smartphone, and I'm sure a lot of you guys have uh, experienced this, is that it works great in a quiet room like this. However, if you're in a work environment in, a, in which it's very loud, for example, in a healthcare setting, construction, or even when you're on the streets trying to message your colleagues, it doesn't work very well. And that's because automatic speech recognition significantly decreases in loud environments. The advantage of having an ear device in your ear is twofold. First of all, the ear is designed to know the difference between signal and noise. What do I mean by that? If I'm in a group, I usually face the person I'm interested in talking to. If the person on the, the right is becoming more interesting, I face that person. And so there's a lot of auditory cues that naturally uh, exist if a device is in your ear. Secondly, um, because we have control over the exact signal that goes into automatic speech processing, we could do a lot of digital signal processing to it. In other words, we could do active noise cancellation. In other words, if I'm in a factory floor, I could cancel all that uh, sounds of the machines so that they could hear my voice much more clear clearly. I could also do things like directional voice capture. What that means is if I have multiple microphones in each, each ear, then I can very fine-tunedly hear just the person in front of me and cancel surrounding sound. So if you put a much cleaner signal into the automatic speech recognition system, as you can imagine, you get much better results. <clears throat> now to the more juicy part that you guys are interested in, the ear operating system. 
or, or a software platform. When we say your operating system, it's really not operating system in the traditional sense. What I really mean is that we have a tightly integrated software that sits in three locations. One is on the ear device. So on the ear device, we do some audio processing that I mentioned earlier. We do directional voice capture. We do active um, noise cancellation. We also have some embedded commands on the device so that even though you're not connected to the phone or the cloud, um, you can do things like uh, power, on, power off the device, um, turn on and off the noise cancellation system. We also have a very unique feature on our device called audio buffering or 30-second recording. For example, if I'm at a conference like this and I meet 10 people, and unfortunately, I have very bad memory and I forget their names. Um, with this device, if I tap on the device or if I say, oh, that's very interesting, it will capture the last 30 seconds, translate it, and put it in a database. And finally, we do Bluetooth management on the device. And that's very important because Bluetooth is such a huge power drain. Finally, on the handset is where we keep user configuration. We also keep learned preferences. For example, I might have a VIP contact list in which only certain people could contact me at certain times. For example, I, during the workday, I probably want to hear all my messages from my boss, but maybe other people, I don't want to hear their messages. So that's our learned preferences. We have some embedded um, automatic speech recognition on the handset itself, so that even though you're not connected to the cloud, you can understand some voice commands. Of course, we have server protocols. Um, uh, we also support voice biometrics. What that means is I can authenticate using my voice print. Um, we do smart notifications and input-output optimization. And then finally, in the cloud is where we do all the AI. Again, I'll go more in detail about that AI engine in the next, the last section. But this just shows that we have the database and the audio files, and the, we do data indexing in the cloud. We actually use a third-party automatic speech recognition system. We're currently using Microsoft, Google, and also Kelby. Why we're using Kelby is that this allows us to also um, send audio clips. Um, on top of that, on top of the ASR is we have our deep learning engine. And what that deep learning engine allows you to do is to understand, as I mentioned before, natural language conversation. It's able to personalize the sound settings for you and the environment that you're in. It allows us to create um, different ontologies automatically. It will be able to figure out when and how a person wants to get messages. For example, right now it listens and says, hey, I'm giving a person's giving a talk. Maybe we won't give all these notifications right now, which would be very nice. And then voice recognition correction. So what's the benefit of Smart Year, Year Operating System? First of all, it, develops, it enables developers to build um, voice applications without having to change their back end. In other words, they could um, create apps just as they are currently, and we are responsible for changing that text to voice. And the advantage of having a tightly coupled software platform that connects a device, the smartphone, and the cloud is that because of that, we can better control and have optimal battery utilization. For example, as I mentioned earlier, Bluetooth is a huge drain. And so we can make sure that we only turn the Bluetooth on only when we need it. Also, we can uh, make sure we have very the best response time possible. For example, all the audio processing is done on the device and not in the cloud. So again, you don't have that time lag. And finally, we have features unique to the device. So we have started the integration of Cisco Spark REST API to our ear operating system. Um, we support a lot of, we voice enable many of the concepts that exist in Cisco Spark such as the concept of rooms, membership, teams. And we can do things like list, you know, create um, rooms, get the details of rooms, get an update on rooms, uh, delete people from rooms. But one of the interesting things we could do is, for example, watch a room and get audio notifications if somebody posts that room. So currently, we're using webhooks to connect the REST API to our EOS 
cloud server. Um, and we started developing our AP, Smart Year API, and it's right now under development. But if anybody's interested in devel developing to it, I would love to talk offline about it. And then finally, we use a third-party push service, specifically we're using the Firebase cloud messaging so that we can push notifications to our client. So what will Smart Ear API provide? It will provide natural language understanding and dialogue manager. We'll have some pre-built um, agents, such as you know, so things that do support, um, reminders, um, and maybe we could, we're thinking about doing language translation. Next, we also do entity and intent extraction from the message body. In other words, if I say, tell Susie I'm running five minutes late, it will understand that I want to send a message to Susie saying that I'm five minutes late. We can easily create new domains, and I'll explain why that's so easy to do with our deep learning engine um, in the next section. Uh, we have a notification manager so that we get only notified when we want it. We have a conversational manager. We convert also text to speech and speech to text. And finally, we provide some analytics and reporting. So now, what kind of applications can we build with the Smart Ear EOS API? Um, as I mentioned in the very beginning, currently people are interacting with the Cisco Spark mostly via visual. However, you can imagine a lot of enterprise settings, such as healthcare, fuel service, construction, hospitality, retail, manufacturing, logistics, and sales. Um, you can imagine you want to do the, communicate with your colleagues in a hands-free way. Right? You don't want, for example, you can imagine in manufacturing, you don't want to take off your gloves, take your phone out, your tablet, and then message your colleagues. Right? This is hands-free. You can do it, and in a loud environment too. So here are just a little bit more details about just two of the scenarios. One is healthcare. Right? You, um, currently, we're talking to a message platform that specifically deals with the healthcare sector. Um, and it connects the nurses, the staff, and the doctors. Currently, what they're doing is they're taking the smartphone off and saying, hey, there's an emergency room seven. But obviously, that's not what they want to do. And so Smart Ear will be able to do this hands-free. Again, if they are using, using Cisco, Cisco Spark, we could do the same thing. And then another use case is manufacturing. Again, not only will it allow for hands-free messaging, but we do all that sound processing to make sure that your message is conveyed as clearly as possible to the recipient. Now let's talk about that deep learning engine. So our deep learning engine is focused on natural language processing, obviously. Um, and our neural net is initially trained first by crawling the web to get the idea of what our sentence is, you know, that they're made out of words, that they're phrases, that they're paragraphs, and just the structure of a sentence. Next, we also um, add, um, use databases such as DBpedia. So DBpedia is really a Wikipedia that's structured. And what that helps us do is get a better understanding of ontology. So what ontology is, is a relationship between words. For example, it understands the fact, for example, in the messaging domain, that when I say ping, tell, contact, whisper, whatever those words are, that all refer to the idea of sending a message. And that Susie, Richard, Tracy, those are recipients of a message. And then finally, we also train it with some natural language query sets. The great thing about having using deep neural net to do this is that it automatically makes, generates ontology. Um, and the advantage of that is previously when voice assistants were initially made, these ontologies were, had to be manually made by hundreds of linguistic PhDs who would put all these words in categories to talk about wh how these words are all related. However, because these, are now, these ontologies are now automatically generating using our deep learning engine, we're able to first of all make a very much global model. The advantage of global model is that if we want to support new domains, we could do it much more quickly. For example, as I mentioned, right now, we are supporting messaging. However, if we want to also be able to support the integration to Google Maps, 
we don't have to redo most of this, right? We have a global map, a global model. We only have to fine tune it for words related to maps, such as location, right, left, timing, distance. And yes, and then we fine tune this neural net by um, using a training sets that we get from getting a bunch of people in a room um, and asking them, for example, a hundred ways of saying that they want to message someone. And we've been doing this for six months and collecting a lot of li live data specifically on the messaging domain. And finally, we use feed forward network to do ASR correction for contact names. And that's especially important for foreign names. For example, my name is Kinu, and Siri thinks I'm a boat. So hopefully this one will think I'm a human. And finally, the result of a, uh, the training will be a runtime model that outputs intent and entities. So in other words, the intent is to send a message, and entities is to Dean. So what's the advantages of using deep learning? It understands contextual dialogue. It's able to um, be able to notify you exactly when you want it. It allows you to do auto ontologies. And it also is able to control your auditory environment in a natural way. So let me talk a little bit more about what I mean by this um, true conversational interface. So again, it, it can extract um, a user's intent and intention just by natural way of speaking, right? Previously, um, I remember when you had to have a structured way of saying something or the assistant wouldn't understand. Now I could just say casually, hey, um, ping Dean that I'm running five minutes late. Actually, um, tell him that I will be five minutes late instead. Whatever it may be, I could just talk naturally as if I'm talking to a human being. Um, it makes use of context to track a user's intent across multiple dialogue turns. What I mean by that is, here's an example. The aqua is Tom the user, and Ada is our assistant. So it says, Ada, can you please tell the executive team to meet me in the conference room B in 10 minutes? The assistant says, OK, ready to send? Wait, cancel that. Can you have a meet me in conference room D in 15 minutes? OK, ready to send? Actually, let's also ask the marketing team to this. You could imagine doing this on Cisco Spark, right? But this has a much more flexible way of, again, changing the recipient, adding recipients, and changing even the content of the message. Um, also, it supports um, contextual dialogue and remembers your preferences. For example, on my contact list, I might have 10 different Richards but it understands that Richard Ling is the person I talk to the most, and therefore will ask me, it won't tell me, ask of all these Richards, it'll just say, do you want to send the message to Richard Ling? And I would probably say yes. And finally, ASR correction to improve name recognition. As I mentioned earlier, we use a deep learning engine to also make sure that you, don't, you get important notifications only when you need it. In other words, if it was a simple Bluetooth, that means all my notifications for my phone will arrive in my ear. If, again, if, I, if, if right now during the talk I was wearing a device and it was pinging me, I think I would probably throw the device away. So it's very important to really be able to hear the auditory environment and give notifications only when I need it and only from important people for me at that time. Finally, auto ontologies, as I mentioned, we can easily support other domains um, in two weeks versus six months if it was done manually. And finally, auto, automatic auditory management. This is how it is. And it works, you know, assistants work fabulously in quiet rooms like this. However, it doesn't work in an in environment such as a manufacturing floor. But now with this device, you can do all that sound processing so that it's as, as if that person is in a quiet conference room. Finally, with the integration of the Smart Ear um, API and Spark, we can now have Cisco Spark in your ear. That means we can have hands-free communication and that it will work in all auditory environments. Thank you very much. Thanks. Thanks, Kinuko. Okay. Um, 
Next up, we have uh, Wissam Al Ahmed from Splunk. Yeah, give a woo woo. That was that was good. All right, um, I'm gonna grab the laptop for her. Cool. Oh, you got it. Thank you. Thank you. Um, okay, now is the time when I'm supposed to say jokes. I think, right? <laughs> okay, so here we go. Uh, let's see if I ruin it or not. Okay, knock knock. Interrupting cow. Moo. <laughs> okay, that's all the jokes I know. Sorry. Oh, you got one. Oh, here, hold up. Who's there? Oh, knock knock. Me. Me who? Ah, wow. <laughs> that's hard. Okay. <laughs> okay. You good? All set? Are you? One more question. I think he's bringing something. I'm not sure where it is, but I we'll start. Yes. You're good? OK, cool. Yeah. Um, well, remember, 20 minutes. She, she was on time, so now it's up to you to <laughs> make that happen. <laughs> Hello, everyone. Only have 20 minutes, so um, <laughs> everything I say, we're public company. <laughs> Just close your no. <laughs> We're required to, you know, everything I say here is forward-looking, uh, and this is what we're supposed to as a legal. This is one of my favorite quotes. So um, I'll, I'll, I'll be talking about uh, big data and analytics, and for those of you who are not familiar with Splunk, I'll, uh, we'll, I'll give a little overview of what Splunk is. But we're, uh, we're uh, you know, platform for uh, big machine, uh, machine data. And I love this quote because really that's the rea reality these days, right? I mean... Um, information and data and big data is with us every day and it's not going to go away and it's growing in petabytes and, and, and more. And what we need is good engines, good engine that would analyze uh, this data for us that will give us meaningful meaning to that data for our everyday today. Uh, <clears throat> just a little bit about me. I'm, I'm with Splunk. I've been with Splunk for almost three years now. Uh, uh, and um, before Splunk, I've you know expert uh, uh, technical uh, skills in in various uh, you know t uh, technologies like big data, security, cloud, and it's nice because that brings all that uh, Splunk Splunk ties everything all that together. Um, and I like this picture because this was uh, shown at one of our uh, events, and one of our marketing guys, uh, a shout out to Mike, he put this together for me. If you don't know Lebanese, Yalla Habibi means let's go, my dear. So this helps me kind of, you know, let's go, let's start. Uh, so a little bit about what Splunk is. So I'm wearing here one of our T-shirts. So I'm sure if you've been one of our, uh, one of the conference like RSA or, or, or any Cisco Live, you've seen lines of people lining up to a Splunk booth to get uh, one of our T-shirts. So uh, this is me wearing one of them. And, and uh, we're famous for that T-shirt called uh, Take the SH Out of IT. So we're not only a t-shirt company, but we do sell software. So that's... <laughs> uh, when you look at this, what do you see? Um, you know, this is a, your typical data center, uh, lots of servers. Uh, we see, may, maybe for people, most common people see, yeah, I see servers, I see racks, that's all I see. But there's more. And actually, we actually see at Splunk, we see data. So everything you see here in this building, on these racks, um, in the floors and the wires, there's data everywhere. There's data coming in and coming out. And, and what do you do? I mean, easily you can probably, there's petabytes of data, if not more, every day coming out of kind of from these machines. So what we call this, this is called machine data. It's, it's human readable machine data that's uh, emitting from all these uh, devices. And they're coming at volume and different variety, different sources. Some data come from API, some data comes from uh, syslog, as you know, or from, from pure uh, packet captures. So what do you do with that data? I mean, some people just buy just like a log uh, tool to just to look at some, some aspect of that data. But there's a lot going on in that data. Here, let's take a look at what does it look like. So here's an example of, of a, a data set across four data sources. I have order information. I have the middleware. My Java backend is emitting data. I have my uh, support, uh, my call center. Uh, there's data uh, about the calls. And there's Twitter also. Social media is another form of data. Well, what if I want to tie all the data together to try to find 
uh, issues in my environment before even a customer uh, uh, reports these issues. And that's where actually Splunk comes in. I'll, I'll talk more about that in detail. So people ask, what does the word Splunk mean? It comes from sp uh, spelunking, right? Digging the caves, exploring caves, underground caves. And that's what our mission is. Our mission is to give you meaning to your data, to help give you access to that data, make it valuable for you, make it easy, uh, usable, by giving you access to uh, tools to analyze that data and visualize that data. And Splunk is available to everyone in an in a, in a enterprise, so they can, everyone can access that data. There's no more need for silos of logs and tools to be spread out or different part of the organization. You just go to Splunk, and that's where all your data is. So back to my example. So if you look at these connecting the dots, let's connect the dots here to look at the story here I'm looking at. What I'm looking at here is, let's say my executives say, I want to catch issues in our environment, in my application environment, before even they are reported. And that's one way to look at that. If I connect all these four data sources by customer ID, so I have a customer who placed an order, and they have an issue. So I have an issue happen right now in my Java environment in the back end. I can track that back to my which order this was placed and look at my support ticket. So someone's trying to place an order, it failed, uh, generated Java error, they made a phone call with the support team, and then they tweeted about it. This company is, you know, they tweeted something bad about you. You are uh, providing the service. So Splunk can actually give you the ability to tie all that information together and do that in real time. So you can actually catch before something happens uh, right away. E even if it happens one customer, what if another customer is going to start ha uh, have, to have the same issue? So Splunk is going to give you that ability to alert you right away when these, these patterns happen in your environment. I want to play you a clip, uh, actually, Yelp is uh, a recent success story that was uh, shared publicly. And this morning, actually, Yelp had a webinar to discuss about how they use Splunk. Let's see if this video can play well. Yelp's mission is to bring consumers and local we get audio. Oh, okay. And they'll probably have to tell the computer to send it there, which is why we don't want to send it to the uh, HDMI, HDMI. But I'm so sorry. It's on the second one. We're doing live technical uh, oh integrations. <laughs> All right, we're good, hopefully. We have audio? Okay. Yelp's mission is to bring. Okay. There's well in excess of 10 right, to one more bring time. consumers and local businesses together in ways that are not possible otherwise. There's well in excess of 10 terabytes of data flowing through Yelp every day. Prior to using Splunk, our log data was actually in a variety of disparate data sources. With Splunk, we're now able to bring them all together into a centralized place and take actionable insight on multiple data sets, including log data, database data, and data from third parties, all together in the same interface, and then provide beautiful visualizations that are actionable and available to business users with minimum level of engineering investment. Splunk has improved how Yelp develops and deploys new applications by giving us direct insight into the code deployment process and monitoring in real time our server fleet to ensure that code deployments are smooth and error free to be able to deliver features to users as fast and reliably as possible. It was very easy for our non-technical team to implement Splunk uh, simply because once the reports had been created, the visualizations were clean and beautiful and we didn't do any training when we rolled it out. We simply gave the users access and explained the visualizations that they were being presented with and they were up and running. The real-time nature of Splunk is extremely important to us to be able to address the real-time needs of our business. Food delivery happens in real time. A key component of customer satisfaction is being able to take real-time action on their order and ensure they get things on time every time. No one likes waiting around for their food to be delivered. With Splunk's help, we're making those wait times as short as possible. 
I don't believe there's any other product in the market that's able to quickly bring together the diverse data sets, offer the powerful language to the engineers to be able to do the analysis, and then ultimately deliver beautiful, visual, actionable reports to the business users. So uh, what's neat about the Yelp case is that they're actually bringing in about 10 terabytes from many data sources, including AWS Redshift, Kafka, uh, Docker, and many, many other more databases as well. And they're focusing on, on their infrastructure. They're tying in, looking at all their infrastructure layer, all the way from uh, servers to web uh, to actual performance of the application. And that's all happening in real time. Another cool thing is that the data the democratization, which is basically sharing that data among all the users in the organization and give them all access. So that's your DevOps capability right there, be able to give everybody transparent exposure, what's going on in, on the environment so they can quickly make decisions uh, to push the uh, updates. So this is an overview of what Splunk is. So Splunk is a full feature platform so uh, from indexing, search, and analytics of, the, of big uh, data, you don't need to get different components if you want to uh, do your own that, uh, analytic solution. It's all in, in Splunk. Um, you, you collect the data from any uh, sources, as we mentioned, uh, any location, any volume, and also any types of data. There could be servers, it could be sensors. And also what you do is actually you're able, you're doing an analytic, uh, uh, search, search on that data in real time. And uh, we don't store any uh, metadata on the, we don't store the fields uh, in or the schema on that data. We actually extract the schema on the fly at search time. So that when the next time a type of data changes, it automatically get recognized and actually uh, extracted on the fly uh, as well. And also Splunk has the ability to create reports, of course, and analyze the data uh, through dashboards. And also we have customization. So as, as a developer, you can customize any dashboard uh, that's provided in any app or uh, on, on, on our marketplace. And also we have provide developer tools, which we're going to be talking about um, uh, as well. And also among the tools, we also have toolkits. So machine learning is one of our toolkits that we provide that you can actually uh, you know, use and also to augment more your anal analytics uh, in your own application. Uh, on that. So literally with Splunk, you can actually, with the Splunk tools, you can develop your own analytical solution, analytic solution. And I'll mention, there's an example of that, uh, that Cisco recently uh, uh, developed a, an analytic solution for Mexico City. So in summary, Splunk is schema on the fly. We don't score schema. We're not like your traditional database. Uh, indexing of uh, universal data uh, in any sources um, and uh, at any volume, there's no backend database, it's just an index, and, and there's no need to filter data. You don't need to uh, create filters and have a special uh, a way to pro process your data. You just create a search. You just ask Splunk a question, and then it will give you the answer. Kind of, uh, you know, almost uh, not only just a search, search capability like a search engine, but beyond that. You can actually ask statistical questions. You can apply also machine learning models and predictive analytics. So what do you get with that? So Splunk evolved from you know, 10 years ago just being a log tool for IT search, uh, but more to cover many use cases, because now we're able to collect all this data from different data sources, give ability to analyze that data, and ab ability to develop your own uh, content uh, to analyze that data. So you actually have applications. We have partners and developers developing different applications in the areas of IT operation, application management, security is a big area, uh, business analytics, industrial, um, and, and IoT, of course. So Cisco and Splunk, Cisco has amazing set of APIs. We all know we're all here for talk about APIs. And then we've been uh, working with Cisco for many years now on several integrations. And we have a lot of joint, happy joint customers using all those integrations for many of their uh, uh, you know, exposure of, of their data and, and to get uh, this insight on what's going on in their environment. So you have rich data from security products like ICE, uh, Firepower, Umbrella, Meraki. Uh, cloud log. So these are all recent, the last you know few months integrations that we're and then we're, um, I work personally with the Cisco team, amazing team, to working on integrating uh, all, all those uh, all those data and APIs. Uh, in the data center world, we have UCS data that we can actually use in Splunk and use that part of monitoring the whole infrastructure. 
And yesterday, I believe Chris Martin was uh, from Cisco. Was the, uh, Chris is here. Hi, Chris. <laughs> Uh, Chris uh, demoed and talked about Spark integration. So actually now with Splunk, you can do bi-directional integration. Not only Splunk can ingest data, but Splunk can actually initiate actions from, from uh, Splunk itself into another uh, system. In that case, Spark, creating Spark rooms on the fly. We also have the Adaptive Response Framework, which is a framework that allows, in the security world, able ability to integrate with many different security technologies. So you can actually trigger actions uh, and augment intelligent uh, uh, feeds, uh, threat feeds, into your also Splunk environment. This is an example of what you can build out of just out of the box from Splunk and using the free apps that we have, uh, free Cisco integrations. So you can actually build your own security solutions if you want, or you can use the Splunk Enterprise uh, uh, Security Solution Premium app. And you do that all through the integrations that we have with the APIs. So imagine, let's say, uh, what happened with recently with the uh, WannaCry, uh, with the uh, uh, ransomware attack. If you have access to all that data in your environment, you have all of them in Splunk, you can actually connect the dots very quickly to see the behavior going on. You can actually look at context of the device brought into your environment. You can actually get the, the, the malware trigger event from, uh, from AMP, and you can correlate that with which device in ICE, and also take an action using the adaptive response from Splunk outbound into your environment to maybe quarantine this device. Uh, I want to move on quickly. I have five minutes. So this is the. Uh, I want to give an example of uh, an integration with API. So Miraki, we have uh, been uh, several uh, integrations with Miraki, what we call add-ons, and then because ability we have in Splunk called the HTTP event collector, we're able to bring in all that data through cloud, cloud all through on-premise or cloud to cloud, and you can bring do that all at, at scale. So HTTP event collector is a, uh, a way to collect data. Uh, over HTTP with no agent required, no software is required. All you do is to have uh, the endpoint that's um, that, uh, the generating that data to post that through HTTP into your event Splunk uh, box. And it's very um, easy to configure and scales to millions of nodes. So all of you, I want you now, I want to showcase this uh, HTTP event collector. So I have this demo that you can actually do right now. Everybody have your phone. And I'm sure all connected on internet. No, nobody these days is not connected on internet. Go to this URL or use or scan. So I want to demonstrate here ability to live. You can actually um, collect that data from your from your question. This we're gonna poll. This is a poll of just two questions, uh, and then we'll try and make it fun. And in real time, I'm gonna show the dashboards. Uh, in real time, looking at that data that's coming from your phone into this uh, Splunk environment that I will show you. So I see everybody shaking their phones. So th part of the poll is answer a question. What's your favorite food? And, and also, uh, looks like sushi is the most preference. So as you see live right now, we're collecting your input live from the, your uh, browser on the phone so using this HTTP event collector and getting live data. Uh, and, and we can actually look at how many people are using the Mac, Android, iPhone right now. And uh, there's an option which I turn off. There's an option to ask you to log in so we can actually tell who's, who's, uh, who's answering the questions faster. I just left it anonymous right now. So we can actually track who is faster shaking their phone faster than... Uh, than, than uh, but it looks like sushi uh, is so far as the... <laughs> The most fav the winner, yes. I was hoping falafel, but that's okay. <laughs> <laughs> I was actually thinking to make falafel on tacos, but that's good. Um, so let's move along. So this, how we do the integration with Meraki is using the HTTP event collector. Uh, the Meraki cloud, as you know, integrates through the API by posting the events directly into Splunk, and this can be Splunk on premise or Splunk in the cloud. Uh, and then we can do cases like analyze all that data in, Sp in Splunk by looking at uh, how many customers I have coming into my environment. We're going to be using uh, Meraki, for example, in conferences, right? If you need to track people walking in the conference, and you can see which booth they're going to more, uh, you know, the most, which popular, which speaker could be popular more than the other. So you can look at the return visits. I can also use Splunk ability to do pred predictive analytics to predict wait time of, of customers on different uh, days of the week. So I can maybe want to uh, staff my store more people on certain days 
uh, more than other days. So I can look at my, uh, use my Meraki data in Splunk to, to predict that. Um, I want to talk about this recent uh, project that was shared publicly, and it's, uh, this is in Mexico Conectado. So in Mexico City, uh, in Mexico as a country, they have an initiative to increase the, uh, the spread of internet usage for uh, schools and government uh, and many, many places in, 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 the, in the city. And um, one thing uh, was uh, the Meraki was deployed across many different locations, and Cisco used Splunk uh, to analyze that data to give real-time analytics on the connectivity and internet usage with the, with the service providers. So um, quickly, I'll show you uh, a demo here. This is in Spanish. So I'll, I'll and I have Colin here with Moraki. He can actually help me out. Uh, so basically, what you're looking at here is a dashboard in Splunk that showing you the total number of usage, internet usage consumption going on right now across in in in, in Mexico. Actually, I can look here. What's unique about uh, in Splunk? Actually, I can look at the data from different angles. What we call they, they call this interface multi-dimensional uh, a dashboard. So actually, actually drill down here and say, well, I want to look at my education sector. Let's see how many in education uh, folks are using the uh, the usage of, of the internet. And actually, I have a little translate plugin here. So as you can see here, I have this is a number of users in total right now connected, and how many uh, bandwidth consumed right now. So you could probably have a certain target goal you want to. You can look at that here in real time and, 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 and look at that. I like this dashboard too, uh, looking at the operators. So this is distribution of the, the service providers. So maybe the government will require certain service providers to have a certain quota for the government, for example, or for users. That's one way to look at that visibility in, in, in real time. So again, this was Meraki. Uh, this is how it was done. This is the architecture. Meraki data flowing in into, uh, into queuing, uh, into query system. Uh, all that data happening through HTTP, being collected by Splunk HTTP event collector. And it's been done at scale. So you imagine the number of data here, in millions and millions and terabytes of data, all collected uh, through uh, Splunk here in this case with Meraki. Um, very easy to integrate with Splunk. I want to mention some of the tools that we have, and we're focusing a lot also on, on helping developers to develop quickly. And so I'm going to wrap up here. Uh, so these are the tools that we have uh, available. Go to dev.splunk.com uh, for, for information more about these tools. Uh, and you can download Splunk for free and download some of the apps for free. And also, we launched a few months, uh, few months back the Splunk community page on DevNet. So we encourage you to have all the resources you need to develop contents and apps for, for, for Splunk for develop your own analytics uh, solution like was done for Mexico. Thank you very much. Cool. Warm. Thanks a bunch. All right. So next up, uh, we have Corey Gwen. And uh, Corey's going to show us some cool stuff with uh, using Node Red. Uh, along with the Meraki APIs. Um, and then we'll have one more after. So thanks. I don't have any more jokes. <laughs> that was good. You got, you got a joke, Jose? Oh. <laughs> Do I need to move this to the other side? How about uh, who, who, raise of hands, who, who really has enjoyed the conference? Oh, wow. It's like 100%. <laughs> you guys are sycophants. Yeah. Uh, oh, the giveaways, yes. Yeah, there's a giveaway. OK, great. And uh, are people sticking around tonight, uh, heading out tomorrow? OK. All week, all right. OK. Who here has done mini hacks? Oh, good. Okay. You good, Corey? Yeah, I think so. Okay. All right, let's do this. Cool. Warm welcome. All right. Hi, guys. Uh, my name is Corey Gwynn. I am a systems engineer with Cisco Meraki. Uh, I've been with the company since it was a startup uh, when I started in San Francisco 
moved to London about six years ago, then now I live in Amsterdam, um, working with service providers and all, all things Meraki and, and IoT stuff. Uh, but today I really wanted to focus on kind of what else I've been doing. Um, I will be talking a little bit about, you know, specifically the Meraki stuff, um, but really I want to talk to you really about my journey of how I've started to understand what the Internet of Things are, uh, is, and all the, the technologies behind that. So uh, it really all started with Lego for me. Um, I became an engineer um, really when I was maybe like 10 years old and I built this giant Lego structure that had like a working elevator in it. And my dad said, you know, you, I should be an engineer. And at that time, I thought like a train engineer, you know? And he's like, no, someone who builds things for a living. I was like, oh, that's a good idea. I could do that. So Lego really gave me the tool to allow me to, you know, actually create something. Um, you know, I have ideas and then I can make it tangible. And I really love that concept. Well, fast forward a couple of years, uh, several years, um, and I'm, you know, sitting at my computer and um, one of my colleagues was playing with this program called Node Red. He was trying to do some home automation. You know, he walks into his room uh, and maybe like the, the window shades, you know, open and shut and, you know, fancy stuff like that. So he was playing a little bit with that. And I was like, oh, that's, that's pretty cool. Um, and around the same time, um, I had gotten a Lego train set for Christmas. <laughs> My wife randomly got it, and she probably didn't understand the, um, the Pandora's box that, that would open. I was like, oh, Legos again, awesome. <laughs> and so I had this Lego train set, and uh, you, know, you could control it with infrared. And I was like, oh, this is pretty cool. And I was like, I wonder if I could automate this thing somehow. And I was looking at the Node Red application. I was like, I wonder if I could like, link these things together and do like an IoT train set. And I was like, all right, well, how do I do this? And so then I started looking at, you know, like Raspberry Pis and Arduinos, and I was trying to understand, well, what is the difference between those two? You know, are they the same thing? Do I write them in the same languages? And then I started to really understand, like, the nuances where a Raspberry Pi is basically just a, a system on a chip, a small Linux computer at the end of the day, and you tend to use, like, higher-level languages with that, you know, JavaScript and Python, as well as Node-RED. Um, but then, like Arduino, I was like, well, what, what would you do with that? Well, that tends to be more of, you know, it's a microcontroller. So you're writing on a lower level type of code, like C, C. And I was like, well, generally, C is kind of tedious to write in. I'm like, oh, do I really want to go that route? But I understood there's certain value in delegating tasks to a microcontroller. Things like moving a servo, right? That's just a motor but you have to send pulses to it constantly to actually change the direction where that's going to be. Well, you don't want to tie up your normal computer with those operations, so you delegate that to a microcontroller. And so now I'm like, okay, well, I got to learn C++, uh, which I studied like once in school, and I completely forgot it. Uh, did a little assembly, too. Luckily, I have nothing to do with assembly anymore. Um, but then I was trying to figure, okay, my goal with my train set, I want to do something really simple. I just want to be able to detect if a train is going and uh, maybe move down a crossing arm. And so that required a sensor, and it required some type of communication and something to control that servo. And that is really where my whole project kind of started, from that, that one objective. And so I'm, I was thinking, how do I relate this back to the Internet of Things so I'm just not some guy playing with Legos, right? <laughs> so, okay. What is the Internet of Things? It's like the hot topic, it's the new buzzwords. I'm like, well, what? I mean, I know what the Internet is, I know what things are. I mean, how is this different than computers and servers talking, right? And so I really kind of started breaking it down. And as I see the Internet of Things, it's really just a collection of sensors, so inputs. You have some sort of logic that does analysis or it just kind of routes that traffic somewhere. And then you have your outputs, actuators, servos, motors, light switches, all, all that sort of things um, now can start communicating. And it could be just little bits of data, you know, just the temperature, just the state uh, of something, maybe motion detection. And it's how you start aggregating that data and you start leveraging all of these other uh, pieces to start doing interesting things with it. Now, again, I'm, I'm not really a programmer by trade. I've been basically a network engineer like the last 20 years. And so I was trying to relate 
how do I get into this world of connecting things that tends to be more programming oriented, but you know, leverage my skills as a network guy. And again, I keep coming back to this program called Node-RED, where you're basically sending data as message objects, right? little payloads. And that, to me, it sounds like a network. right? I have my packets, I have packet headers, and I'm routing that traffic, and I'm doing interesting things with it. So that's exactly how Node-RED functions. You basically have um, these nodes, these little you know, uh, widget things off to the right. Those each um, represent some portion of the IoT network, right? Um, off to the left, you tend to have your inputs. In the middle, you may have some function, like a JavaScript function or some pre-programmed like, logic. And then off to the end, you have your outputs. Um, the green boxes here are just debug nodes where they just print to a console. But that could easily be, you know, send a tweet, send a text message, um, send uh, something to a Spark room, right? All of these things now are, are the outputs. And so I actually built uh, an application using Node-RED, which was really just a tool developed by IBM um, and kind of their emerging technology space. It's open source, um, has an active uh, you know, developer community, and allows you to really just kind of hack around for free. You just play with it. You have all, all sorts of possibilities of how you can connect things. So I actually built a node um, using JavaScript, or Node.js, rather, um, where I'm able to consume the Meraki location uh, data. Right? So I can use Meraki access points that are listening for Bluetooth beacons or phones in your pocket that are scanning for a network. You know, when your phone says, there's available networks, would you like to join? Well, it knows that because that phone sent out a broadcast. And your access points um, can just record that. And they could reply and say, these are my SSIDs, you can join. Meraki access points will happen to just say, right, I heard you ask for a network. This was the time of day. These were the three access points that heard you, and I'm going to triangulate that information. Now, I'm going to send all of that into a JSON format into something that cares. So just like Splunk was able to start consuming that data, I'm going to consume it in my own application here. So all this is really doing is pulling in that data. And then what I actually did is I just searched for a client. So it scans that data, and it looks for my MAC address on my phone. And if it sees it, it says, you know, welcome back, Corey. We missed you, right? And if it hasn't seen me in a while, it's like, Corey, are you, are you coming back? And, and so I actually built this at the last hackathon. And so we had APs everywhere. And I used um, a Twilio integration, so sending text messages. And so if I left the hackathon, I would start getting notifications like, dude, you got to get back to the hackathon. <laughs> right? And so I come back in, because it's a 48-hour job, so I was like trying to take breaks. But I would annoy myself by leaving. I was like, OK, I got to go back. Right? So that's just a simple application. But you can imagine all the sorts of Internet of Things. I'm triggering actions based on you know, context. And that's the whole idea. So um, back to my, my Lego story. <laughs> um, what I did is I built a massive Lego city. Um, it started with just, <laughs> it, it started with just a, a simple train set. You know, it went in an oval. And well, now I figured I could probably buy a lot more Legos for educational research. Uh, so I started buying a lot. And everything I bought, I was like, well, now I got to figure out how I can connect this to my Internet of Things. So what I did is I would really just, you know, I, I do these presentations in terms of technology, and I would, as a sales engineer, try to figure out use cases for this technology. And one way I figured out is instead of me just you know, selling the dream and talking about all the great things you can do and then waiting for some customer to actually invest in it and rebuild it, and I hope that it actually worked, um, what I'm actually going to do is, well, I just buy a bunch of Legos, and I represent the exact same fundamental concepts, but at a small scale with little plastic people. right? <laughs> and it's been great. So here's just an example of some of the, the projects I was doing. So um, I would have like a weather sensor that detects humidity and temperature and all that. And then I would relay that using MQTT. So it's a low, uh, it's the messaging protocol um, where it's, you subscribe or uh, publish um, small bits of information. And so I would send that up to, to Node-RED, and then I would rebroadcast it. And so off to the left is an actual billboard, and it shows my local weather and time and cycles through a message of the day. 
I come into the room, Meraki Access Point detects my phone, sends a message to the billboard, says, welcome home, Corey. Right? I'm connecting things here. Um, the city itself, you can see the Palace Cinema. Those are actually rainbow lights that are going on. If a movie is playing in my neighborhood, if it's a premiere, the marquee lights will start triggering off. And then you can start to see like, the lights in the theater start moving around and all of that. I also have um, other lights. If someone visits my website, I call it my disco test or like my hello world, um, it triggers just a rest call and the lights will start flashing. So I can tell if people are, are visiting my blog or going to my website. Um, one of my proudest things is off to the right was the train, right? So this one I went pretty complex with. I used an ESP8266, which is a small microcontroller. It's basically a Wi-Fi chipset where people have been able to hack it and basically run additional code on it, right? So it's really small, fits in the palm of your hand. And I put that inside of my Horizon Express train. And so now that's connected to the Wi-Fi. And then now I can use Node Red to control my train via Wi-Fi. Well, why would I do that? Well, my infrared train was awesome until it went under the, the city. I couldn't see it, so infrared can't see it to control it. And now I wanted to also do cool things like um, run a schedule. So I tied into the Transport for London system. So I go get their entire train network. And now I pull in the local train schedules and I put them on a tiny OLED screen. And my train um, across the street would go to basically two train stations, Chess Hunt and, and Enfield Town. And depending on which way it's going to go, I would actually switch the LEGO train tracks using a little servo, microcontroller attached to that, then start the train, you know, and I could look at the schedule and know if I'm going to make my train in time, right, just by looking at my train city. A um, couple other little fun projects I did. Uh, a motion sensor, you can see the, the little Cisco uh, a Lego piece there. It basically just detects human presence. And then I would turn on the lights in my city. And if no motion, it would turn it off. So that's my energy saver concept there. Um, and then I also have an RFID badge. So my, my little two-year-old daughter loves playing with these badges. And so I decided I'm just going to build one myself. And so I bought some RFID scanners off of like, you know, some Chinese website, got there a month later for about five bucks. And I was like, all right, what can I do with this? Again, I attached it to a small microcontroller, connects to the Wi-Fi, and then I have just like um, these little functions that look for these serial numbers. And so if you scan, it'll either beep success or beep fail. And then I had a couple of badges. And so if you scanned one, it would start my train. The other one would turn on the lights on a, on a palace cinema, you know, marquee or what have you. So just ways of interacting, you know, I can unlock something. So, you know, I did a lot of stuff with Lego, which was awesome, but I also have a day job too. So I went back to Meraki stuff, right? <laughs> so this one's really cool. Uh, we were working with um, Heineken and they wanted to be able to track their kegs um, because kegs cost some money, right? And what they were able to do is put a little $5 Bluetooth beacon on all their kegs. They put a Meraki access point in each one of their bars or the local areas. Now, the access point would detect the presence of that keg. And so that allowed them to understand where the kegs were out you know, throughout the city. And then we tied in with Cisco Spark. So if I were to click on a keg, it would generate a work order and a Spark room and say, uh, this keg is, is ready to be collected. Right? So really cool things of, of tying it all together. And I'll show a little bit of demos if I have any time left at the end. Um, I also tied in with the Meraki dashboard API. So network orchestration, how do I change the SSID of a network? How do I um, connect uh, or list my license status and devices? Or maybe I'm a service provider and I don't want to provide the full access to the dashboard. Maybe it's a managed service and I want to provide the customer with just uh, a few essential tools. Or maybe a technician um, who needs to do deployment and he only needs a small subset of tools. So what I did is I built my own web service using Node-RED where I basically create my own API to then call the Meraki API, and then I built my own um, app using AngularJS and Ionic, um, which then calls my API. So I've created this, this filter where I can control the security and the options that are available while using Meraki APIs in the background. Um, and then the final one that I did with, with Meraki was a captive portal. So I have my Lego cafe here. The typical use case is like you want to have you know, a hotspot. 
um, you know, hotels, cafes, and I use that exact same concept, but instead of like just IoT stuff, it, it really is just a web server. Um, I have my handle, my XCAP click, which is basically like the URL you would go to, and it basically presents a HTML, CSS splash page, um, and then you enter the information in, and then I can store um, that into a database, now I have your MAC address, your IP, your email, and then I can link that to maybe location services, open up a Spark room as soon as you've logged in. You know, if you want to have like an ambassador who's you know, there once you've logged in, all of these things can now start to be connected. And again, this is how I see you know, technology. It's, it's networking and it's Legos to me. It's like APIs and servers are all the same things. I'm just connecting the dots and building things. And once I kind of figured out the knobs and the, the options, yeah, there's a lot to learn, but it's, it's really fun, you know? And I've, I've been able to understand a lot more about the world, basically, in, in terms of technology and, and mechanics um, through my IoT you know, projects. So um, I got just a few minutes, so I'm gonna try to show just a few of you know, things in action. So this is my, my website where I basically you know, document all of these projects that I do, all open source, every single thing I've written. I, I give you the schematics, the, the code in whatever language I'm learning of the week, uh, and then examples and all that sort of stuff. Some of it's complicated, some of it's pretty straightforward, but either way, it's interesting um, to, to go through all that. Um, here's an example of this is the city itself. It's all managed um, in this Node-RED application. And you can actually see up to the right, this is actually real-time data um, that's going in. So it's sending billboard messages right now. So if I were to come into the room, it would update that and, and send me some more interesting information. Um, I can see like all of the different components that I have off to the left, like uh, my disco. Uh, it's going to turn on a bunch of lights in the city. I can turn on the lights or off and on. I can you know, switch my tracks um, for the trains, uh, you know, control them both by infrared, motion sensors, via Wi-Fi. I just build everything. And so at this point, I'm like, well, if I connect this dot to this dot, what can I get away with? Or can I connect this to this? And now I, you know, the possibilities are endless. And so then I can slap on a, a, a simple UI, and I can control it in a more like, uh, friendly way. So now I can control maybe my, uh, my water fountain. I was learning MicroPython the other day, and so I made um, a little water fountain in my LEGO city, and I can control the RGB lights um, using this, just because I can. <laughs> um, I was getting like my local weather stats and pulling that information out, representing that, and seeing how all that works together. And then you can kind of see, the, again, the live stream of data that's coming in. Um, kind of going to the Meraki side, you can see my, my simple app that I was writing here, where again, I can manage my Meraki dashboard, and I can do all the typical things you might want to do, but I built my own dashboard. So now I don't have to go to my product guys and beg for features. I'm like, oh, I wish I could do this. I decided I'm just going to build it myself. <laughs> <laughs> and then share the source code. And so really what this is doing, <laughs> yeah, I probably shouldn't have said that. <laughs> um, but um, yeah, so this is basically just tying into a Node-RED backend. And so now instead of my city, this is actually pulling in device status, claiming a device, showing my network devices. It's all the same now. It's, it's Internet of Things. It's dashboard management. I mean, once I've learned these basic technologies, I can pretty much do anything. Um, and then here's an example of the Heineken map where I could say, um, I s found my 27 kegs, I can hover over them, I can say collect this keg, and you should see, if I hit OK, collection request sent, and then eventually um, a spark room um, uh, message would, would appear, and it would say, your keg is ready for collection. So that's what I've been doing. <laughs> Thank you, guys. Uh, about this, uh, yeah. where is your craggle switch? Yeah. <laughs> and how much craggle did you use? Yeah, well, my tier was trying to get involved. And I was like, I was actually becoming that guy. I was like, no, everything's <laughs> perfect. <laughs> uh, so I've had to build a special zone for her. It's a safe space, right? So. Yeah, good. <laughs> I figured. <laughs> cool. All right. All right. So uh, we have Jose next. Um, Jose Bogarin. Um, and who I think I might have just messed up your last name. Yeah. 
Nice. My bad. Um, and he is going to wrap it up talking about where apps meet the city infrastructure. So, um, you know, stick around. He's got some very cool things to, to teach us. And uh, we're almost there. Okay, raise of hands. Right. Who's seen the Lego movie? I have it here. All right. If you haven't seen the Lego movie, that's why you didn't get that joke. So go see the Lego movie. It's quite good. <laughs> um, and I think, is there like a Lego? Now it's the Lego Batman thing. They're like really going franchise on it. So now it's, is it? That's cool. Oh, hey, Jose, do you need a clicker? No. Do you need a clicker? Yeah. Cool. How do you get full kegs delivered to your house um, using your Node-RED app? And do you have customers other than Heineken? <laughs> <laughs> These are all great questions. <laughs> he won't reveal his secrets, is what he's saying. <laughs> all right, you good? I think so. Just about? Yeah. yeah. Cool. It on? Okay. Okay. Well, thank you. Um, well, my name is Jose Ogrimisolano. I'm the Chief Innovation Officer at Altos, a company based in Costa Rica. We're a Cisco partner. And also, I probably can say I'm one of DevNet's biggest fans. I'm proud to say that I was here in the first DevNet zone in San Francisco 2014. And I've seen how DevNet's been growing from you know, San Francisco, San Diego, Las Vegas, and now with DevNet Create. So I'm really excited that this event is probably going to mark a um, turning point for Cisco and the whole DevNet zone, the whole DevNet team, and how they're going to grow in the next couple of years. My company, we're based uh, in Costa Rica, and what we do is basically, and sorry, can you put the timer, the 20 minutes? Or, yeah? Okay. Um, and I'm excited to see that um, how well my company has been using Cisco technology to improve uh, the services and the products that we've been giving to our customers. This is basically my agenda. So I'm going to talk about uh, the Altus Corporate Social Responsibility Program, then about Open 311, about a book named The Responsive City, and some open source efforts, and a little bit of a call to action here. So we went and um, started thinking how we can actually improve the community attachment that we have with our local government. And I really love this quote, that community attachment its an emotional connection to a place that transcends satisfaction, loyalty, and even passion. And that's what we wanted for our uh, company to actually have that connection to the local government in, in Costa Rica. We're based in Costa Rica and, and within Costa Rica in a city called Curitabat. And again, we're coming from a small country, and Curitabat is a small, small uh, place in, in Costa Rica. It's only 16 square miles, and it has only 77,000 know, population of people. So I'm talking from a small country, because again, Costa Rica is only 5 million people. But the kind of problems that we found there, it's problems that you can see in places like Chicago, or even San Francisco, DC, or New York. When we start talking about uh, doing something like a corporate, uh, social, corporate social responsibility program, we went with the, what you can say probably the usual stuff. So we started thinking about helping maybe in paying some schools or even go ahead and building some you know, houses. But you can maybe say it's the usual thing that you think when you're doing some CSR program. So we, we actually talked to the government and we thought about doing something like this. So this is a project that we, they done, and uh, we were not part of it. But it's like getting this wall, that it's a pretty ugly and crappy wall, but getting this wall and maybe improve it. And what they did is actually get ahead and, and engage with the community and do something like this. And it really made the community proud of how they actually get together and how to improve their, you know, the, the, the city where they live. So that's the kind of projects that we think or we thought that we can actually go ahead and work with the government and, and do that. 
But when we got there, they actually said, hey, maybe with your technical skills, we can put that to better use. And here's the challenge that they sent. They wanted to improve the community engagement. They wanted to use technology to make it easier for the population to give feedback to them. They wanted to, for us to actually develop a model application for them to get information from the constituents more easily, then develop a dashboard and analytics so they can get th that information and drive the policy decisions that they have. Because, I mean, we're talking government, and sometimes in government, the decisions are not really well informed. So with this mobile app or with these technical you know, skills or information, they wanted to actually go ahead and drive that. We started researching and found about Open 311, and it's, um, it actually ties to what the um, uh, people from the U.S. Department of Commerce said in the, um, in the keynote uh, earlier about how you can actually use open data to improve the government. I have another quote here that I really like. It's that good governance, it's not what creates this glue of civic attachment. Rather, it is civic attachment that creates good governance. And it basically, um, you have a good government when you get the people engaged. And that's what we're trying to do with this mobile app. Get the people from the government or get the people from the city engaged with their government. So Open 311, it's an open standard. It's an open model. It's an open data that you can go ahead and report and track non-emergency issues in public spaces. So we're actually going ahead and getting this information and driving that um, to you know, the people from the government and figure out what the best decisions they can take using that information. It's actually a very used standard, and you can see cities from all around the world using that standard. For example, you can see Chicago, you can see even San Francisco, that was one of the places that really started using Open 311. And you can see, for example, Boston, you can see Bloomington, and there are a lot of places in Europe that are also using Open 311 you know, technology. So we actually um, started coll collaborating with this team to see, or with the government, to see if we can actually implement that in Costa Rica and in Curitabat. And we started working a little bit with them to, to implement Open 311. Here's some of the details of that technology. So the formats, it's uh, XML is the required format, and JSON is the optional one. The encoding has to be UTF-8 required everywhere. The definitions, you can actually go ahead and create a service. Then you can actually go ahead and you know, do a service request. For example, you can create a service like uh, street light and then a service request that says that a street light is broken. You can create a service that has to be like, you have to have good roads. And then a service request that, it's, uh, that you have a problem with that, like a pothole in the, in the road. And jurisdictions in case you're using that information between different cities. And it's actually a fairly easy to use API or fairly easy to implement API. It's just uh, very six um, methods. So you have the get service list and a get service, a post, a post service request, a get service request, a get service request, and a get service request from token. So it's very easy to implement. I mean, it took us probably, and I say took us, but probably it was Alf and his team. Um, it took them maybe like two or three weeks to implement that, Alf? No, it took us two or three weeks. Our developers just took the time. Okay. Okay. Yeah, so we actually implemented our operation using Golang. And again, it took us maybe like under, under a week to actually implement that. So that's the kind of technology that we've been trying to use in in that local government. Here's a very um, easy example. So you have that information about, you know, getting a service request, getting the status and status notes. So it's a very easy to use format. It's a very easy to use um, interface. And you have that open data. So you can actually go ahead and request the data from San Francisco. You can request the data from Chicago. You can request the data from Boston. All that data is uh, publicly available. And the common problems that you have, it's, it's not rocket science, to be honest. It's, you know, regular things that you can see in your communities. 
So problems like potholes, which in Costa Rica is a huge problem, sorry to say, but yeah, problems like potholes or broken streetlights, garbage, uh, vandalism, other problems that might compromise a public space. And right now, the, in the technology that you have, it's very simple. I mean, you're just reporting a streetlight or a problem with streetlight. But what will be so cool is when you have that mobile app to actually get an alert that if you're walking through that zone and it's, I don't know, 9 p.m., you maybe get an alert saying, hey, there's broken streetlights in the next two or 300 meters. So you, you might take another route that it's safest for you because you have that problem there. So right now it's, it's more for the citizens to report problems to the um, government, but we still need to figure out the best way to actually get that information and get feedback to the citizens to make their route to home easier or more safe, right? The next step, it's uh, actually talking about this book. So when we start uh, researching more about it and researching more about how we can actually go ahead and improve the, our local government, we started figuring out uh, through reading this book, it's The Responsive City, Engaging Communities Through Data Smart Governance. It's by Stephen Goldsmith and Susan Crawford. The Stephen Goldsmith was the mayor of Indianapolis, and then he was a deputy mayor for Major Bloomberg from, I think, 2000 to 2008, or something like that. Um, so they're basically uh, talking about the experiences in different cities in the U.S. And the challenges that you can find, because it's not always the technology, the technology that is the hardest part, and sometimes the problem is cultural change. For example, you get some resistance to change. And we were lucky enough to have a conversation with the CTO of the city of Boston, and he told us about that in some places they're actually having a hard time implementing some technology, and they're waiting for the people there to, sorry to say, but for the people there to retire. They're, they don't want to actually fire people, but they're waiting for the people there to retire in order to bring people that are more, you know, easy to adapt some, to some changes. They're also having some to train some people in this technology. I know that we say that it's so easy to actually get a nice smartphone and go to Facebook or something like that, but it's not always easy for some people. I mean, um, if you say that you have maybe 60 years and you've been for the past 30 to 40 years doing something like, you know, getting a paper and doing it like that, it's not always easy for them to do it um, using, you know, a smartphone. You also have even legal challenges. In some agencies in Costa Rica and some agencies in the States, you have the problem is that the people are worried if they can actually go ahead and even share the information between agencies. It's not always as straightforward as you would like. So you have to actually take care of um, what information you can share and what information you can't share, right? Then you even, <laughs> that's the hardest one. You even have political challenges. Maybe you have a very good initiative, but the subsequent government does not want because it was from a, another party or you know, from some other person, and they don't want to continue that initiative. So sometimes the technology challenges are not the hardest one, but the hardest one maybe are the, the challenges that you face in the social part. And, um, yeah, and you get the, even the technology ones that like, for example, using old technologies or monoliths or even having difficult integrations. <laughs> and the hardest one is even having lack of information di in digital format. In the morning we talked that maybe having PDFs is not the best way to actually share information. But at least a PDF is way better than having to go to a, you know, a storehouse or a warehouse where you can't have a lot of paper. And we faced that problem in Kuridabad and a lot of the places that we talk in that book, you can actually see the problems that they had because a lot of the information that, they, um, that was useful, they actually had that information in paper and they didn't have that information readily available for everyone. So I'm going to talk a little bit about um, use cases or things that um, the th uh, people are doing in, in places, for example, in Boston. So they have the 311 app in Boston. I don't know if somebody here is from Boston or Massachusetts. No? Yeah? Okay, we have one. Um, 
So they have this 311 app uh, from Boston where you can actually go ahead and again report and there's a problem with a car, there's an abandoned car, or there's a problem in the street light. And they call it like their internal part, it's the CRM, which um, we're used to call it like a customer relationships manager, but for them it's a constituent relationship manager because they're trying to improve the service that they're giving to their citizens, right? The other part is they're having a mobile app for their city workers. So um, with this mobile app, it's very easy to them to actually go ahead and um, assign a task to a worker that it's, uh, they don't have to go back or come back to the headquarters or the, you know, to the government and then to the city hall and then um, assign a new task. So they can get that task very easy in their mobile app. So one of the use cases that they've been talking about it's a, a person that it's handling maybe in information about the recycling, and they got a 311 request for information, and in five minutes, because that person was very near to where the person that requested the information, so he went ahead and delivered that information like in five minutes. That is something that if you're used to working with government, you'll probably say, hey, it's gonna take probably one month to get that information, and they were able to handle or deliver the information in just five minutes, which was an amazing experience from uh, a user experience kind of a, you know, point of view. In Kurridabad, in Kurridabad we have that application. It's called Joel Calde or um, Hey Mayor or something like that. So um, they're using that application to get information about, again, the same problems that you face in all these big cities, problems like rats infestation, problems like, this, uh, again, potholes or broken taillights. Um, and they're actually trying to now improve the application to do floods monitoring, right? So they're building sensors with the community to put in rivers and using that information to actually get an alert, like not an amber alert, but you know, like a public alert using the mobile app. So they can actually go ahead and um, make it safer for, for the people living near a, a river, right? In Chicago, um, Chicago's a fascinating study case. Chicago's doubling down in their information or their investment in technology, and they have it centralized in a big initiative. It's the Digital Chicago. They even got a donation from the, a grant from the, the Bloomberg Fund Foundation, a $1 million grant to work in these projects. Uh, for example, with Plenario, with Plenario they had, uh, it's a centralized hub where they can actually go ahead and get information from the different open data sets and make that available to people from, you know, from the Chicago so they can develop some applications. They have also OpenGrid, that it's a dashboard, a geospatial dashboard that makes it easy for them to analyze information in historical or event-based information to see, for example, again, maybe uh, 311 service calls, maybe 911, um, 911 or 911 calls. They can get information about, uh, I don't know, for example, fires, and they can actually go ahead and cross-reference that information. And you have also a use cases in Rio de Janeiro, which I feel bad because probably F Flavio from the Cisco office in Brazil should be up here talking about it. But uh, the Cisco Innovation Center in Rio actually um, created or worked with the local government for the 2016 Olympics. And they actually built a couple of useful uh, cases. They have manhole monitoring because they had a problem with garbage in the manhole. So when it rained, they're actually the city uh, flooded because they had the problem with the garbage. So they built an application to actually monitor that and send the people from the government to clean it up so they can avoid um, that, that problem with flooding. And one of the um, use cases that I really like, it's uh, interesting, not really sure useful, but at least very interesting, is that they're doing traffic monitoring and assigning like music notes to buses or a music bus and music note to taxis or cars. So you can actually go ahead and um, have information about music of the city. And I don't know if that's the right name, but it's something like that, music of the city. So you can actually take your smartphone and depending on the traffic of, day, of that day, you can actually go ahead and hear, um, hear depending on the buses or hear music, and no music notes 
depending on the taxis or the cars. So it makes, it, it makes the city alive and it makes the community more engaged with their, with their government. Finally, uh, one of the things that I would like to talk about is that here's the application that we've been building. It's a native script application uh, for the mobile app, and it's a backend for Golang. And what we're trying to do is open source it, and we're actually going to open source it um, for getting more community traction because, again, this is part of our corporate social responsibility program. So um, it's, a, well, it's a name to be defined, so if you have good options or if you want to actually name it, just not do it like the UK body my face uh, thing that they did <laughs> past year. But um, I'm actually going to upload it, or we're actually going to upload it to GitHub. And I'm when once it's uploaded, I'm going to put in the Cisco Spark uh, space, the, the DevNet space. So if you're interested in this technology, please um, go to developer.cisco.com. On the bottom uh, part, you can go ahead and sign to the you know, Cisco Spark chat for DevNet. And probably in the next couple of weeks, I'm going to show that information and share once it's on GitHub. Our basic idea is to form a community around this, um, as around this mobile app and trying to solve those small problems or big problems that some of the cities can have. My call to action, um, again, I'm a huge fan of DevNet. So I really like the four pillars that they have. The first one is learn. So please learn about technologies like Open311, like Planario, like OpenGrid, and maybe the, that um, mobile app that we've developed. The second pillar is connect. Please connect with your community and connect with your uh, local government. It's something where you can actually make a difference. The third one, inspire. You can truly inspire your colleagues, your neighbors, or your authorities. You have that power to make a change. So please get a, um, you know, connect or inspire people around you. And the uh, final part, code. Your contributions are going to be very valuable. It's something that you can go ahead and make a change in, in, some, in some people's life. Imagine maybe um, helping some people, that a single mother that's having problems with her family, to actually go ahead and get help more easily. Or imagine maybe a homeless person and help them th helping them get back on their feet. Or maybe a child abuse victim to get better service from their service from their social worker. So those are the kind of projects that I believe that you can actually go ahead and make a very good difference. The final quote that I really like, it's from, and pardon my French, and not because I'm going to say a bad word, because just because I don't know how to pronounce it, but it, from Antoine de Sonic Supri, it's uh, the author of The Little Prince, and I really like this quote. If you want to build a ship, don't drum up the people to collect wood and don't assign them tasks and work, but rather teach them to long for the endless immensity of the sea. So what I'm trying to do is have you actually long for the endless change that you can provide, the endless goodness that you can do within your local government and the impact that you can have in people's lives if you do, if you start working with technologies like these ones. Uh, well, and finally, well, the references that uh, I can share with you, uh, basically that book about the responsive city and technologies like Open311, Planario, OpenGrid, and that's it. Well, um, thank you, basically.